Anyway, we're here with Jason Felix in this crazy San Francisco. He's a cone subs artist. And can you introduce yourself to all the viewers who might not be familiar with you? Uh, sure. My name is Jason Felix. I am currently working as a full-time freelance artist, and most of my clients are associated with video game development. So most of it is uh, electronic arts. I've done a lot of work with in the past. Uh, I worked with Blizzard Entertainment, and uh, a few of the game projects I worked on was uh, StarCraft. I worked on Prince of Persia series, and I also worked on just recently the Dead Space series. Dead Space series? Yeah. So, still, uh, still under development? Yes, it's an ongoing series. So, so far there's two installments. Actually, I think there's three. Maybe a little more. And then uh, on the side, actually, I'm developing my own pro projects. I got uh, books that I'm writing, I got the picture books for children that I'm uh, developing. And also, I'm um, actually on the side, when I get time, I'm actually doing some traditional painting uh, because most of my work is digital. And I'm actually trying to get back into doing the traditional, um, you know, skill set. I might have a gallery show in Paris next year, so that's why I'm working heavily on these paintings. And what got you interested into drawing art? Uh, that's a good question. I guess I never was, I never thought of it in that way. Um, the best to explain it was just, ever since I was born, I was drawing, so... Even, even I can vaguely remember, my mom has like a stack of drawings that she kept. She's like, you remember these ones? I don't know. But they're really, really cool. You know, it's just anytime I was doodling, um, you know, my parents were constantly just giving me sheets of paper to draw on. So, and it turns out also a childhood friend that I'm still friends with, um, preschool until age four, actually I met, you know, this, this other kid and we, just, we kicked it off. And so our parents were like, oh, they should hang out. So, uh, his name's Jason Delvo, and uh, so we end up, at age four, we'd go, he'd come to my place, or vice versa, I'd go to his place, and we'd just spend the whole day just drawing. That's all that we would do. And, I wonder uh, what happened to him. Well, he's still, I, I originally grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, so the Midwest, and he's still there. Uh, he, he went a little bit of a different road, he went and did graphic design, um, which actually is a really good discipline. It's a completely different way of, of working. It's a lot more analytical. It's less, uh, I would say, spontaneous. It's more, you know, just very, you know, corporate IDs. I mean, how, <laughs> that's very, uh, you know, structured. There's, there's no, like, hey, I'm just going to wing it and make something up. So, you know what I mean? It can't be so free-flowing. Like, hey, let's, you know, let's make something up. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. So pretty much you can't pull things out of his ass. No. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. No, that won't go over too well. What kind of tools do you use to produce your work? Uh, for the most part, um, I've always... I'm always started off doing traditional work. And soon as digital became a viable way of working, especially with the computer. Um, you know, the, before, let's see here, 1984, 85, um, yeah, you know, shit, that was the Commodore. Anyways, fast forward, uh, I think it was around 92 or 93 when they finally, uh, they finally evolved to Photoshop. Ooh, and I was actually trying to paint with the mouse. And it wasn't until, I think, 97 that I went full digital. That's when they got the Wacom tablets where you can actually, you know, draw on those and be immediately on the screen. I remember, I remember going to a computer show and seeing those people showcases Wacom, these drawn tablet stuff. In fact, I still actually own my drawn tablet stuff, which, which I haven't even used at all. Mm. Although the package is still open. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was not until when that uh, actual hardware came out that was actually a viable way of actually producing work. But up until then, it was, a, it was a great skill to use Photoshop to manipulate photographs, you know, do color adjustments and, you know, graphic design, all that sort of thing. Um, so then as soon as that became, once again, a viable way, because in video game production, because I've been involved with video game development for almost 12 years now, um, you know, just creating 3D assets, you had to use Photoshop to generate these texture maps, and then you map it onto the, the models, and blah, 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 blah. So it was a necessity. So 
but now it's, it's actually it's, it's getting to the point where you can be a traditional artist and you can be a digital artist and, and still find viable ways of uh, making a living. Doing two things at once. Yes. Um, do you listen to music while you're doing your drawing sometimes? Mm -hmm. I do. I found recently that I don't. Up until maybe six months ago. You know, I was always put on different music and uh, I love digital abstract music where there's no lyrics, it's just music and, and different tones and different patterns and vibrations. This sounds really, you know, like you know, hit an acid or something, but uh, you know, it's just like a mu music that allows your thoughts to kind of flow. I used to love listening to that music because it really would uh, get me really entranced while I was drawing. And now, actually, uh, I find I need to concentrate on what I'm doing. I can't just look, oh, well, I'm just going to wing it. I really concentrate on every stroke and every move that I do, so I find um, actually music is distraction now. So usually uh, I don't listen to music anymore. So it's uh, just just my train of thought, which is odd. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many games have you played so far, for which you had done work for? How many games? How many games have I played that I've worked on? Uh, yeah, how many games have you actually played for which you did art for? I see. Uh, that is a tricky question because a lot of the games I've worked on never released. So I would say two. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, ten, 12 years of development and only two games. Uh, so uh, StarCraft, and not the original one, it was actually the sequel. The, and, the second game? Yep. And the other game was uh, Dead Space 2. And that's it. Now, the weirdest thing, though, is that uh, with, within game development, especially uh, initially when I started off, when I went from 2D side scrolling to full on 3D, there was this development cycle where people are just trying to figure out what the engines are going to be. So everybody's trying to write their own code and trying to figure out actually how to get these, these engines working properly. So, what ended up happening was uh, development cycles for games were about three to four years on average, sometimes six. There's one game uh, that's coming out actually I think at the end, I think the middle of this year. You mean Duke Nukem Forever? There you go. Twelve I, years. <laughs> I, I remember that game that says, oh we're gonna announce it in 19, oh it's gonna be released in this date in 1998 and then they push it to 2001 and it says, okay then since we're not finishing it up we're gonna finish it when it's quote unquote ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And there was actually even a uh, little promo they did where they actually, because Gearbox took over that after, uh, was, it, was it Take Two? I can't remember the initial company, but anyway, it's a company that folded that. Yeah, had. Gearbox and Take Two. And so, uh, so Gearbox took over the property. And then the guy who was the founder of Gearbox did like a video promo. He had a big banner of Duke Nukem. He's like, all right, it's finally coming out. And it had a little banner saying June 12th or something like that. And then they demoed it at the Penny Arcade thing. Uh, they did, but during this promo that he was doing, there was somebody who came behind there with a little slip and actually changed the date and went from June to like July something. And uh, of course, the owner actually turned around. He actually looked really physically pissed off. He's like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> he <was> completely <laughs> lost it. He's like, you gotta be kidding me! Because the, because they're legendary for always pushing the date back. <laughs> so, but yeah, but anyway, so yeah, so two games in twelve years. Um, yeah, there was a Prince of Persia game that actually never shipped. That was I spent about three years on. I uh, spent about three and a half years on a, a game that was called StarCraft Ghost that never shipped. Um, I was working on uh, two other games for EA that actually were not announced, but you know, spent uh, at least a year on that didn't ship. So you'd be surprised. There's a lot of games that, that go into production but never finish. And what was that Prince of Persia game titled? It's just Prince of Persia and then a number code or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a number code. Exactly. Yeah. So it's you look for it, but you won't find it though. Um, how long have you been contracted by Wizards to do work for them? So far, it's been about three years. So two thousand eight. So I've been work for them. They've been really cool. They've been really a, a great, a great company to work for. Um, because I. Within the gamut of, well, I'm going to narrow it down when it comes down to actually illustration and artists, being artists and painters or whatever else, uh, Wizards has always managed to, um, 
I would say, attract the right pool of talent. But from film, from video games, you know, you can name it. So, anybody who's really into following um, artists and their names, you know, there's like Ian McKay, and there's Brian Church, and then there's... Uh, yes for Mapers. Was that? Yes for Mapers. Yes. And, I mean, the, the, the list can go on and on. So, it's, it's always got a great pool of resources that people have uh, been attracted by. So it's been really cool. Um, on top of doing work for them, they're just really nice about supporting the artist. You know, they put your name out there. Um, right now, on the average, they fly me out about four or five times a year, different parts of the United States, and, and do signings and you know promote the product, but also meet the fans, um, do drawings for people on site. And um, it's, it's really reciprocal because people get really excited about meeting the artist. Um, you know, and I get a chance to actually do the face-to-face -face time with people. And, and I don't know many companies that do that, that care to do that. And uh, I think that speaks a lot for the company. Interesting. And how did Wizards, how did Wizards approach you for a contract? Uh, there's a show that I, I go to every year, uh, as long as I can remember. It's called uh, San Diego Comic Con. I've heard of that before. Yeah, have you been? Uh, no, I haven't been there, but I've never... But I've uh, heard about it before. It's huge. It started pretty small, but uh, it's gotten massive. So, uh, in the past, I'll go walk around and shop around my portfolio because I just knew that um, for a period of time that there were, if there weren't publishers there, there were other artists that were working for companies I wanted to work for. So, by talking to the artists, it gave me a great insight of a number one, why they're marketable, number two, why they work for the company, and number three, Maybe they might give me a small insight of maybe what I should do in order to get you know, work doing work for them, um, which actually served really well because most most of the artists were really nice. They're really giving and like, hey, you know, they gave me a lot of words of wisdom and inspiration. And then companies started recruiting, and and then it dawned on me to actually, I know there's a big raisin flying around here. <laughs> yep. Dear Lord, what's that thing been doing? Um, so, uh, let's see here. So, yeah, so then it dawned on me that, because uh, they have a space called Ars Alley. And, and so I, I applied for one of the booths and said they get it. And they actually give you a free space to sit down and to actually show your wares. Initially, they set it up so um, comic book artists would actually meet the fans and they would sign the comic books and do sketches. And, um, and then they kind of broaden that net to anything that's um, related with comic books. But game, there's tines for games, and there's tines for movies. So it's all, you know what I mean? It's like this big homogenous. Is that, is the raisin killing it? <laughs> yeah, the raisin is killing it. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, there's it's been this huge tie in with um, all this multimedia. <laughs> I'll get him. He's big enough where I can probably catch him with this thing. Um, I'll figure that knife, I don't think the camera caught it. Oh, yeah. It was my palette knife. But it serves as multi-purpose. <laughs> so you can also swat a fly with it. Yeah. You can swat a fly and gut it up. <laughs> roast it up. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so at, at the the space, then I, you know, it was an artist alley space, and then it turns out that a lot of, actually, um, art directors would actually walk through the space and be looking for, like, unseen or un like, undiscovered talent. And um, so it was about three years ago when I was in Ars Alley that this guy walking by, covert style, was like, <laughs> and he had a name tag that said Hasbro. And, you know, because Hasbro purchased Wizards of the Coast. And they also own Milton Bradley, Parker Brothers, and a series of other companies that used to be independent. Exactly. So now it's just a big, big, you know, wallop of stuff. <laughs> so when I saw Hasbro, I'm like, oh, what, what is it, the toy division or, you know, exactly what they'd be looking for. So the guy looked at my portfolio and um, yeah, so I gave him my, my, my business card and he said, well, I'll be in contact. And then uh, the last day of the show, he stopped by and said, you know what, actually something came up and uh, I need some help. Are you available now, more or less? It's like after the show ends, are you, are you available to start tomorrow to work on some stuff? I said, sure. And then it wasn't until I actually talked to him after the show that turns out it was for Wizards of the Coast. They want Harmion to do style guides, which is more or less a visual bible they send to the illustrators to illustrate the cards with. 
Does that make sense? Sort of. So, they hired me to do concept artwork for Magic the Gathering. Stuff that people would usually not see until many, many years later, correct? They usually don't show that work at all, actually. So, wh what it is, is um, they got their own they got their own properties of building, and they get they got these things called the you know, like waves. So, the, every I think every quarter they would have like a new visual style guide. So they would hire myself and maybe three or four other artists would sit there and talk with the, the writers and people in R and D, and they would say, you know, for this next set, what we'd love to push is the following theme, and then it gives a theme, and then we would illustrate the characters, the costumes, their environments, uh, the creatures. And then they would put this as a big, huge visual style guide, like a Bible. And then when they actually would write the card descriptions, they would send that off to whoever they're hiring to do the artwork. Then they would send, in addition to that, the style guide, the Bible, saying, go to page 45, look at environment of, let's say, the swamp. So have a character walking through the swamp, but make sure the character looks like this costume. And so you kind of build, you know, kind of string everything together. Other than strip mine, go. You're right, exactly. Because I remember that Mark Tadine in said in one of those interviews a few years back with Evan Irwin of The Magic Show, he said, oh, I remember when I was doing this type of stuff for Wizards when they started out, they said, strip mine, go. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. and then he said, oh, this, this artist came in, he thought it was supposed to be uh, explosive device, but then it's supposed to be mine shafts. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, there's always... And sometimes the, the information changes, too. So, yeah. They were like, hey, you should have this scene exploding, and then it should be a you know, like calm, you know, calm day. Like, oh, what? Which doesn't happen too often, but occasionally. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're, it's really good. It's really... Uh, they're, they've got a really great structure. Um, um, and it allows the artists to actually do some of the best artwork I've seen. I'm always excited to see the artwork, so. <laughs> I don't know, I get excited about it. It's, it's cool stuff. They're a cool company. Anyway, um, how much, um, how much of, I mean, how many of your completed works have been quote-unquote graveyarded by wizards when they ask you to do a specific card, but then it doesn't, but then the piece of work didn't actually make it because they decided to axe the card towards during development or towards the last minute. Mm -hmm. uh, from my experience so far, uh, let's say right now I'm on the zero threshold. Zero. Yeah. Zero so far. Yep. Yeah. Zero so far. So, um, I mean, I've heard of it. Uh, I haven't personally experienced it. The only thing I've ever experienced where they would commission uh, some artwork, but I wouldn't know when it would appear or how it would appear, or because you know they have Friday Night Magic and then they got promo cards. And then they got, um, you know, just the regular set themselves. So they got all these different um, ways they can repurpose the artwork. So if it doesn't work for the set, it could be a great promo. Or it could be a Friday Night Magic card. So um, so in that way, you know, there, there was times where I, I didn't know where, where it was going to show up other than when it would show up. I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. I had no idea. Um, but, yeah. But, uh but most, I think for the most part, they, they're really good about using all the artwork they get in. Since you did some stuff for Blizzard, can you tell us how much concept art you've done for StarCraft Ghost? How much concept art work? Yeah. Well, that game experienced such a change of hands. So it was a nihilistic hands, and then it went to... Swinging Ape? Swinging Ape? Yeah, Swinging Ape. And then Swinging Ape, the reason why I haven't heard of them, because then Swinging Ape was then gobbled up by Blizzard. And so that became Blizzard. So, in all said and done, I think it was in development for six or seven years. Maybe a little bit longer. So, when I was involved with it, to kind of give you the scope of it, I was hired on as the lead concept artist. The concept artist? So. So you were the lead artist for Starcraft Ghost? That's right. So then uh, I was predominantly in charge of the character designs, creature designs. Um, it was like more or less just trying to figure out how to reskin what you see in the 2D platform but into the 3D realm. So it was like, you know, evolving the shapes. And, um, so that actually, that, that required a lot of feedback from Blizzard themselves. So, you know, Sam Wise would actually oversee a lot of the production work. I would get you know footnotes from them. Occasionally, some of the producers 
um, one of your art leads would actually come to Nihilistic, would meet, you know, you know face to face, would have a, like a drawing jam, would go over, you know, ideas, essentials. And then when I finished the, the, the previs of doing the character and creatures, um, they did have outsourced uh, a guy named Jay Schuster. Jay Schuster? Schuster, Schuler, Schuster. Uh, amazing draftsman, amazing um, industrial designer. He and so he did a lot of the environment work, but he was offsite. He ended up working for Lucas, and he Lucas. worked on episode one, two, and three. Uh, Lucas Arts. Yeah. Uh, Lucas. Yeah, Ireland. With uh, the George, and then he went over to uh, Pixar. So I think he's at Pixar now. So I remember it was him. Uh, there was a guy named Corey. Corey was in charge of the ID of the environments. Uh, not environments. I'm sorry. The the vehicles. And then, uh, then after I finished that initial work, then I actually did um, Cinemax. So I actually did the, what's it called animatics. So I actually would storyboard it, scan them in, do the pacing, timing, and then actually the, because they're in-game cinematics. And then actually I worked with the the director uh, of the cinematics from Blizzard. So he would come up a couple of times. Um, his name was Henry Higgins, and. Um, so I worked with him directly for a period of time, working on cinematics. And then after I finished working on that, then I moved into doing models, animation. It's the, it was everything. And so when I actually left Nihilistic, uh, it was three and a half years into the project, um, then I heard six months later, then I was you know, gobbled up by uh, Swinging Ape. Swinging Ape took over the project. And as far as I know, Swinging Ape completely revamped everything. So they redid a lot of the character design, a lot of the creature design, um, the scope of the game changed. So so was, there was a lot of new work that was generated from them. And who knows how many more artists from Blizzard actually worked on it. So it was a lot of people actually. I heard I heard from Blizzard that they have not actually axed the project when they revealed their list of all the games that they had cancelled. That'd be sweet. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. I mean, I, I mean, I would love to know. Honestly, I would love to see the project finished. It's, it's uh, to me, there's nothing more frustrating than to work on a project for a long time than have it go and get get the axe. So maybe it might, maybe it might earn, maybe it might earn the top spot for for vaporware for games. Yeah. Because previously it was too can you come forever. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, it seems that right now that that uh, StarCraft, um, the reemergence of StarCraft. And and by the way, so when I mentioned earlier that um, that worked on StarCraft too, so the the art director uh, Sam Wise, um, he pretty much told me in person that, that a lot of the work that I did for StarCraft Ghost that they repurposed it and they used the you know used some of the images in StarCraft too. So. Well, I never directly worked on the project. Um, they they said they they uh, excuse me, uh, they utilized my work for the project. So, Thank and you. I you know I was, I was hoping to get like so do I get a copy, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't. But that's cool. It was flattering to to know that that I was still you know somehow indirectly involved with the project. So <laughs> ironic. Well, I know, isn't it? Anyway. Has Brian Kibler approached you yet to do art for Ascension? Uh, which which person? I'm sorry. For uh, Brian Kibler. Oh right. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah. No. I actually haven't heard. Heard of Ascension? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm aware of it, but uh, but I definitely haven't heard from anybody that's involved with the project. Okay. But that's a, that's a very curious question. That'd be very ironic. And next week, I'll send you a phone call. Like, Hello. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you sign your signature? How do I sign it? I have a piece of paper in my bag. Well, I, it's transformed over the years. It sounds really odd to say. It used to be a symbol, and then it became an insignia, and then it just became my last name. So, uh, yeah. Excuse me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, uh, 
that's the way it was forever. How many years was that? Uh, from 1992 until 19, 1998, 1999. So you, if you see a lot of my work, it usually has that insignia. Also my illustrations, um, you because know, I did stuff for White Wolf for a long time. But now it's just, that's now my, my, my John Hancock, which is, a. Uh, because actually, because of Wizards, initially I was doing that, but people didn't... Because the whole JF, it's supposed to be the whole F, and then... So I just kind of combined it to make the JF. Um, but anyways, so, because of Wizards, I also signed my full name, but then I became way too... Way too uh, engrossing as far as time, so that was just the last name. Yeah. Let's see. So Ascension, now, are you, refer are you referring to the property that uh, White Wolf well, uh, owns? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just curious about it. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, because there is there is a project called Mage the Ascension, um, and I was involved with that project for, for Mage, of, Mage of the Ascension. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of that project. Okay, so that was that was actually for pen and paper games. Pen and paper games. Yep. So the old, you know, the old RPG games. So you know, when I worked for uh, White Wolf, you know, I did a whole bunch of illustrations for uh, for Vampire the Masquerade. You know, all these manuals. I heard of Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah. So I was I worked for them for five years, and I was doing a lot of interior, you know, interior illustrations and some book covers. And then I worked on a series called Ma uh, Mage the Ascension. And I uh, also did a lot of illustrations for that. And book cover artists and illustrator for that as well. So that's why when you said Ascension, I thought it was... Because White Wolf right now is repurposing all the projects that were pen and paper into online, um, you know, games. So right now they're, they're working... They're working on trying to transform Vampire and Werewolf. I'm guessing they're trying to transform all those into you know, some game properties at this point. Mage, <laughs> Changeling. They can go on and on. They're really, they're really robust for um, for properties for for game development. So, if it's not in progress, uh, I would be shocked. Interesting. And I understand that you travel. I understand that you travel a lot. How much stuff have you lost to Homeland Security? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Actually, uh, I travel pretty light, so I haven't lost anything yet. I would say other than food and drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, usually Homeland Security, they they tend to be a lot more intense uh, when I go overseas with Mexico border and, you know, Canadian border. It's usually, to me, it's been a lot more calm. But yeah, just, just traveling, you know, definitely to Europe and everything is a lot more intense. <laughs> Anyway, what does your life, um, what does your wife do for a living? Right now, she uh, has over the years, um, I'll say she's almost like a jack of all trades uh, when it comes to fashion. As myself, we're a jack of all trades to art. Um, you know, I've done modeling, animation. I can go on and on and on about that. Uh, but now I'm focused on painting and conceptualizing. Now, so for my wife, once again, she's done uh, pro uh, uh, quality control, she's done uh, production design, she's done uh, textiles, she's done, um, what do you call it, uh, pattern making, um, and she was a buyer for uh, a clothing manufacturer. Um, she's worked with a number of different labels, Nike, uh, you know, she's worked for uh, got, uh, so many different manufacturers. So, uh, you know, they, they include distribution and dealing with Walmart and Target yeah, so some pretty big names. Now, not the most gratifying companies to work with, uh, just because it's such a, a massive scale. So now she is working right now with uh, with Barney's New York. Um, Barney's New York. Yeah, so the, that's a good company. And uh, on the side right now, she's actually working on her first fashion line. And um, once she has that launched, um, she she has a few places where she's going to do consignment. And then um, she's gonna shop around her portfolio, see if she can get back into you know, working full time as a fashion designer. So, uh, in my opinion, she's a fashion designer right now, and uh, I think she's gonna do wonderful things. So it's uh, I'll say give her about a year, and uh, she'll she'll get her foot 
in the door someplace. I see. What motivated you from moving from Wisconsin to crazy San Francisco? Uh, a very romantic story, but uh, what it came down to was um, opportunity. So uh, Wisconsin, while it was really great to live and to, you know, to grow up, because you know, it was really easy, it was really small. It wasn't much things you can do <laughs> in the initial ones growing up. I mean, you'd play in the creek, uh, you'd go sledding, um, you know, just, just really simple. I mean, I was, I was an avid, I was always outdoors. So I was always like uh, skateboarding. If I wasn't skateboarding, skiing, I was snowboarding. Um, but I loved outdoors. I loved being outside. I loved just doing things outdoors. And I loved the woods and nature, you know, blah, blah, blah. So for that, it was fantastic. But as far as opportunity for art and being inspired, I mean, the, the museum there was pathetic. They had maybe two or three paintings that were just awful. And uh, <laughs> they had more than that, but... <laughs> There wasn't much of a scene there, and uh, there wasn't any artists that were interested in doing things I wanted to do. I wanted to work on comic books, or I wanted to work on film, or work on video games. And now, when this was back in 1991, 92, there wasn't actually uh, a job you could get as a concept artist. That just didn't exist. It, I mean, it, in order to work in film, you had to be an industrial designer. So most people who were working on film were... I, I kid you not, they worked for you know GMC, they worked for BMW, and uh, all these really amazing, you know, Sid Mead was, you know, look at that guy, he happened to be the amazing industrial designer, but um, he got hired on to do some film work that was in tandem with what his skill set was already, but once again, that job was not available. Um, so when I was actually wanting to get into this field, you know, I researched, I looked around New York, um, Texas and, and uh, LA and San Francisco and this is pre, this is before the internet, I know, hold on um, the only way I could find the resources to find out where the market was was actually going to the library using the Dewey Decibel system you know, and, and <laughs> find periodicals like, ah. yeah. yeah, I remember that <laughs> so, and um, you know, find local periodicals basically based upon the film industry, you know, the Cinefix at the time that was actually the only resource I could find for film for video game development, there was there wasn't anything um, other than a few articles here and there in some um, gaming magazines that I would find. And um, so, uh, and I wanted to go to school to study concept design and illustration, and there wasn't anything in Wisconsin for that. So uh, I decided that I'll do it myself, so self-taught. And uh, so what led me to San Francisco was that I put together. And by the way, I was freelancing for White Wolf. Um, doing those black and white illustrations, which didn't pay, it paid 20 bucks an illustration. So I was doing 10 illustrations that would take me 10 hours to do per illustration and getting 10, you know, getting 20 bucks. I mean, it, it was, it was nothing, but it was, it was me getting published. So I was working at Kinko's. So I utilized my time at Kinko's to put together a portfolio and, and just spray it everywhere I could. So I sent New York, sent some places. And, Texas, LA, you can't get the idea. I, I hit wherever there was a market. And I made myself a promise that the first place that would write back to me, whether it be you know, exception, rejection, they want to see more materials, that's where I'd move. So uh, I got my first letter a week later from San Francisco where uh, I was rejected. So <laughs> I booked a flight one way, one suitcase full of clothes, one suitcase full of art supplies, and flew to San Francisco. Never been to the city, went downtown, um, found a weekly hotel in the Tenderloin. By the way, you know, 15 years ago, moving to the Tenderloin, holy crap. It yeah. was, oh my god, it was, it was not cool at all. Yeah. No. <laughs> a, guy <laughs> could, a guy could take a piss in there and nobody would care. Oh, god. People just shooting up and just, <laughs> women just hanging out and selling the wares. And, you know, I was fresh from Green Bay, population 50,000. <laughs> And I come here and it's just like homeless 3,000. <laughs> so I was really unsettled. I was really freaked out. I was really freaked out. And I had a portfolio um, that was a new portfolio. I went to the offices that turned me down. Literally showed up in person. I said, hey, I'm here and uh, here's a new portfolio. And they were shocked. Like, what are you doing here, man? We, we, we kind of sent you a rejection letter. I went, yeah, that's great. So anyways, you didn't see my new work, so here you go. 
and uh, they didn't get back to me and uh, I showed up a week later with another portfolio and to the point where they were really uncomfortable but they were nice about it and saying no we don't have a vacancy but we'll keep you in mind so, um, so I ended up transferring my job from Kinko's to here because I didn't have any other job and um, was able to live off of that and this during dot com boom so it was you know rent here was just ridiculous which is crazy. So uh, I was able to find a place that was really affordable, worked at Kinko's, and it took me another three years of knocking on doors before I actually got my foot established. So, so yeah, that's my whole romantic story. <laughs> Why I came here. Yeah, very romantic. Isn't, isn't it? It? <laughs> <laughs> it was destiny. Anyway, will you be signing at Worlds this year? Hmm. I don't know. The World Championships is going to be held in San Francisco at Fort Mason this year. You know, you know what's been really odd is that anytime there's actually been either a Grand Prix or a pre-release or something like that within the city, they usually don't contact me about it. But sure enough, I'll be contacted to go to Virginia <laughs> or, <laughs> or, uh, or Atlanta or you, know, you, you name it, like the other side of the, the continent, I'll, I'll, I'll be over there. But uh, So... Um, Realistically, I don't know, and usually I won't know until I would say maybe like a month before the show, before before the championship. I usually, I usually won't know until then. So uh, it would be cool though. Um, but you'd be pleasantly surprised though to know that actually there's a lot of magic uh, artists that are actually here in town. So there's uh, there's there's Jason Chan, uh, this guy named uh, Mike Barrick. Uh, hold on, hold on, let me let me write down. Let's see. Jason Chan. Who else? Mike Birick. How do you spell his last name? B I E. But B I E. And Mike, don't hold this against me. Against me, but the M I E. M I E. B E R K. B E R K. Wit. And then Brockman. Huh? What was the last? Brockman. Um, what was the other name Wit. His first name is Wit. W-H-I-T. W-H-I-T. And what was his last name again? Brockman. Brockman. I don't hold those against me with Wit, too. I just, I just fear that I'm saying, mispronouncing the last names. I'm like, man, I thought we had something special. This guy's a dick. <laughs> 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 mispronouncing my last name or misspelling it. Just like, just like what Michael Moore said and in... In that movie, Bowling for Combine, the president bombed another country again to where which we cannot pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, shit. Uh, this is like a uh, Michael Sutphin who lives here in town. Michael. How do you spell his last name? No, this one I do definitely know. Sutphin. S U T. T. S U T. F I N. F I N. Yep. Interesting. I've heard of these. I've heard. I've heard about. Three of these four artists so far, and I didn't know that they were in town. I thought like the majority were over in Seattle or yeah. Oh, there's there's actually there's a pretty big hub here, and that those are names I can remember offhand. I'm pretty sure there's probably four or five more that, that probably I could probably list off, but we get down to it. No, actually, the first three that I mentioned on the list, they're they're associated with a company called Massive Black. Massive Black. And Massive Black is a third party. I don't say third party. They are an art house that is usually doing development work for, for film and also video games. And they house some of the best damn artists that I've ever met. So the reason why when you ask me about the, the World Champions and it's going to be here in San Francisco, they have so many artists you know, at, their, at their call that you know there's only so many seats that, that they, they'll fill up. So. And Jason Chan is, a, in my opinion, um, him and Alexi, who doesn't live here, he lives in France. But um, those guys, to me, are the premier artists for, for Wizards. They're, they're usually doing all the plain walker cards. They're yeah, especially all... Jason the Mind Sculptor. Yeah. So they, and that, that, was, that, was, that concept design was by Alexi, and the actual card illustration itself was by Jason Chan. And Jason Chan does, and both Jason Chan and Alexi, they actually do a lot of the advertisement artwork for... You know the box art, and then, like I said, the plane walkers. And every time I look at the the price point for plane walkers, holy crap! 
well, that's the starting point. But then, yeah. But then over time, in the price usually drops. Yeah, but they're, um, it's still they're still going for a pretty good price point though. Especially Jason Lines Halter, uh -huh. which at the local card shop over here, it's going for oh, like one hundred, exactly one hundred ten dollars. And then if you add sales tax to it, which the city does include, it, it goes up to like one hundred thirty something dollars. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy. You're so so uh, he's if you try to get a hold of him, he's a he's a hard cat to reach just because he's 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 phenomenally busy. He's really, really busy. But rightfully so. <laughs> you see his work, it's badass. I see. And uh, before we conclude, yeah. I'm going to sign my small stack of cards. Sure. I didn't know you were, well, as soon as you were asking all the different magic stuff, I'm like, oh shit, I wonder if he knows magic. Yep, I do collect some magic. It's not as big, because I don't draft a lot. So far, as, as long as uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun actually working on the cards, and uh, as long as they, they like the work, um, they keep on having me on board, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. It's almost like invisible. Let's see here. Let me use my slaughter table somewhere else. So one thing that, along with doing this traditional work that I've been doing, is just that. Uh, I'm actually going to get back into doing, um, you know, actually getting some of my cards actually painted. Because right now it's all, all, it's all predominantly digital. So that's always been a pretty big question that, as soon as people meet me, Oh, awesome, man. So where's your painting? So I'm like, hey, hey, the digital. Oh. Because it's pretty cool seeing the you know, traditional paintings. It's a big, oh. Because yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, for a period of time, actually, uh, one one thing I, you know, I experienced, uh, I've been talking with the art directors from Wizards, is that uh, they're really, really supportive once again with keeping traditional artists, you know, fed and, and employed. And so when when I initially approached them about doing work for them, um, they actually were adverse to the idea of actually accepting digital artwork. Um, they told me, it's like, we only, hand, we only um, and this is probably about six, seven years ago, they said, uh, we only hire traditional artists. So, so you've got some paintings to show us, that's great, but we, we don't accept digital. Like, what? Are you kidding me? And, I, and um, it's only been the recent years that they've really uh, embraced um, the you know, artwork being done digitally. And uh, I'm pretty sure you can tell if you've been playing Magic for a while, uh, the, the card art has really changed dramatically. And they actually started spelling names correctly. Oh, did they? Were, they were misspelling names? Yeah, they were misspelling names and misattributing some artists, especially Douglas Schuller, where they would always misspell his last name. Oh, really? Oh, man. And then they misattributed another artist for when they, for when they were printing their fourth... Their fourth one, their uh, fourth run for Plateau. Mm -hmm. Instead of, instead of attributing another artist, they just put Drew Tucker on, on the front of the card. and says, "Oh, this is Drew Tucker's work," but it was really somebody else's work. Wow. Really? Well, I'm glad they they haven't been doing that or have found a way to remedy that because uh, yeah, there's nothing more deflating, you know, to work really hard on a on a card than also somebody else gets, you know. Contributed to it, and steals your lunch. <laughs> right. like, what? Oh. <laughs> Have you seen the new Phyrexian set? Uh, yes, I did go to the pre-release for that one, so I could go get the pre-release foil. Oh, all right, there we go. There you go. You got one. Because actually, um, I did the promo card for the pre-release. So, um, so, I'm not sure if you get one of those at all. And then the. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that's, that's a promo. And then the local store also holds Japanese packs. Oh, really? But yeah, 
it's, it's been a trip to work on this stuff because initially they, <clears throat> you know, they hired me on to do conceptual design for them, which then uh, led into actually doing the actual illustrations. So it's it's been a treat though. So, what was the description like for the promo card? Um, there was already uh, uh, first, in, you know, the main plane deck for uh, um, you know for her was already illustrated. So I'm pretty sure you've seen it, and it was uh, Jenna that actually did the illustration. Um, so they sent me that art saying, "Okay, we love this illustration, but we need a promo card, and uh, we'd like we'd like to see your take on it." And they sent me the, the actual design of what the what her what she looked like. And I'm not sure if you've seen what the original design looked like, but it was crazy. It was a. Uh, so, like? so her, she's just. <laughs> that's like her little head and her arms. <laughs> her little horns. And then she was on this huge body. And it actually had a mouth. It was supposed to be all metal and corrugated. And then it's supposed to have these huge legs, like a, like almost like a walker. And then it had these arms that curled up. And then these, I'm not sure what these were, these like flanking sort of thing. So that was literally the, uh, the overall concept that that sent to me. So she was just, you know, the, that small. And uh, in the illustration that um, that Jenna did, which I loved, she really focused on the overall look of the female character and made her look really sexy and really powerful. Um, but, you know, of course, the, they had to condense the actual overall, um, you know, design that was sent to them. So I was trying, so when I got the promo, I was trying to be a little more true to uh, the, the concept design. And uh, so I made I made her, you know, it was supposed to be her in this environment, it was supposed to be, she's supposed to feel really uh, dominating and uh, overly, I won't say heroic, but menacing. So um, I looked at actually um, old vintage war propaganda posters from, you know, from Germany and Russia and also United States. And usually they, they would have a sense of power, which is looking up, but also just the sort of, you know, real gaga. And um, so that's why I infused into the piece. And, uh, and they, they really liked it. So I was, I was really flattered that they liked the idea. Interesting. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure meeting you, man. Pleasure meeting you, too.